are pretty on Ulysses. There it is. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Here I am with a review of This Road of Mine by Shosha Magrina, translated from the Irish by Mahilo Hay. I read this for the Irish Readerthon. I enjoyed it very much. It was a four-star read. It's a very accessible text, very easy to read translation, and it is of a autofiction, I guess. That wouldn't have been the word used to describe an autobiographical novel. It was published in 1940. Published in 1940, by which time Magrina was beginning a sad uh, mental decline. He was institutionalized for psychosis and schizophrenia shortly after this book was published and had his first kind of psychotic break just before it was published. I believe I'm right in, with those dates. Um, that doesn't figure, at least not uh, uh, obviously, in the story that he tells. This is a story of his life that opens in the new Free Irish State, as it was called. It later became the Republic of Ireland, but I believe the terminology was the Irish State. So in the early 1930s, and he's working for this kind of government department, which is a translation, the Department of Translation, and also a publishing house. And I have not been able to find any help with the translation, so apologies if I'm massacring the name. But the name of the publisher is Angum. Angum. If you please help me with the pronunciation in the comments below. And he was translating English books into Irish, and this was part of the the cultural priorities of the new Irish Free State, and his native tongue was Irish, and he was fluent in English, and so he did a lot of translating, but he also was a writer and a journalist, and so uh, there is reference in an excerpt that I'm going to read about uh, a novel of his that was he had submitted for publication. He was born in a small village in County Donegal, which is in Ulster, and which is part of the Donegal Geltech, which means the Irish, uh, Geltech means Irish speaking region, and Donegal is, like I said, part of Ulster, originally um, the kingdom of Turconnell, which I'm going to address very briefly in a minute as I set up the quote that I want to read to you. And I don't know if there's anything to do with his mental health that caused him to break with the life that he had established as a translator, but he does kind of rebel against all the people around him and his identity and his jobs, and he just kind of goes on the open road for several years, and this is that story. He wanders through Ireland, and it, and then his wandering takes him farther afield into Scotland, and especially Wales. And it's a journey of his ornery, curious meanderings uh, through lands and among people that uh, he is by turns disdainful of, deeply curious about. Um, it was a fascinating read. The translator, Mihail O'Hay, does a great job with the footnotes, so there are some references to Irish culture, history, and literature. I looked a few other things up to help me, but for the most part, you don't really need to know anything to enjoy the story. It's very simple writing, it's very kind of episodic, anecdotal, somewhat existential writing. Uh, the existential stuff I could have taken or left, uh, that's not my thing, which is why this was a four-star read for me rather than a five. But I'm going to read you a short section. In setting it up, I'm going to you'll get a few examples of the things that excited me because it was all new information to me. Maybe many of you watching it, and I certainly feel bad for any of you that are Irish or deeply conversant with Irish history, culture, and literature, which I am not, that please add, correct, and supplement what I'm saying here in the comment section below. But this review is targeted towards people like me who are not necessarily plugged in to all those things to assure you that you don't have to be to enjoy the novel. And in fact, in doing uh, deep dives or, you know, getting going down Wikipedia rabbit holes, 
as well as sinking myself into the f few footnotes. So there's not many footnotes. There's maybe 20 in total for the whole book. Just led me to realize how much I don't know and what are some of the next things that I want to find out a whole bunch more about to deepen my appreciation of Irish literature. That's all I'm going to say about the book, other than to set up the passage from page 7 through 9. It's about a page, full page of, of a reading I'm going to give you from the end of the first chapter. So I've already told you that uh, he was working for this publisher, this kind of government department publisher, uh, Am Gum, Gum, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, there's reference at the beginning of this to a manuscript of his own, a novel, that he had submitted there for publication. And that novel, again, I don't know how to pronounce it, An Droma Moore. Um, the Big Drum, I believe, is the English title. It wasn't ever published until 1969, but this is back in 1932. And then there's reference to the Donegal Galtect, which I've talked about. So that is the Irish-speaking region, County Donegal, part of Ulster. And I had fun trying to piece together references here from 1602, Rory O'Donnell. Rory O'Donnell was, I believe, the last king of Turconnell, and Turconnell is now Donegal, and also the first Earl of Turconnell. So that was at the time when England took control, and there were no more Irish kings. Is If that's overly simplistic, it's because I don't know anything. Please correct me, but that's what I've gathered. And he, he reigned as king until September 1603. So... And I found out through Wikipedia that he took over from his uh, older brother, Hugh O'Donnell, who died. And I think died in battle, the English. And they were two sons of the previous Hugh, so the previous Turconnell king, Hugh O'Donnell, whose second wife was Scottish, uh, known as Inin Du. Inindu, and she killed all of her husband's sons from the first marriage or maimed them and so that her one of her sons could who I believe would have been Hugh O'Donnell and then was taken over by Rory. Sorry, this is fun and I'm probably muddling it up a bit but I found it all fascinating and I'd love to know much, much more about it. And, you know, I've talked about it for three minutes and there's only a half of a sentence about it here, okay? And I couldn't find reference to the two towns mentioned, Cornisleeve and Beltra, but the Battle of Kinsale is the famous battle where the Irish who were in league with the Spanish and whatnot against the British, but that was kind of the last gasp of Irish independence in around 1602. And reference to Brehon laws, so it's an ancient Irish set of laws and references made to them carrying on to the present day. The last reference here is Eilich. And Eilich was a medieval province that was roughly the same area which became County Donegal today, okay? So the medieval kings were known as the kings of Eilich and their fort is still there, the Grianan of Eilek, and here's a picture, it's fabulous, I definitely want to see it, and there, the kingdom was from the 5th to the 12th centuries. if I've got that correct. Okay, so uh, that's a lot of explanation, but I'm hoping that at least some of you were as interested as I was about those details, because those are things that were completely new to me. And aside from what I've explained to you, I think that if you know, if you find out as much as what I've just explained to you, that's all that you need to just sink into and enjoy this text, because you will find 98% of what I'm gonna read to you as just very easy to understand, accessible, navel-gazing, 
fictional prose that isn't going to intimidate you at all. So here I go. It's just after New Year in 1932. The story I had in with the publisher, Androma Moore, was different from the usual stuff they published. And there was no way I'd give them the satisfaction of rejecting it, I told myself. So I went down to the office one day and, and took the book away again with me. Maybe they'd never seen someone angry in that office before, but they saw me raging that day, that's for sure. I don't remember everything I said to them, but anyway, I asked for the manuscript back and was forced to grab the man who had it by the scruff of the neck and half-throttle him in the end. And I was delighted that I did this too. Because if I'd spent much longer in Angum translating books to Irish, I wouldn't have had a spark of creativity left in me. Sure, I'd have found a way of making a living all right, but I'd have been like someone who'd neither won nor lost. Just a boring machine, an automaton. I lost out on the cushy number, cursed though it was, but at least I was free to go my own road. And it's not as if I passed the rest of my days without tasting the better nectar of life either. I put myself in harm's way, and even in mortal danger, many a time. Ever since that afternoon when I jumped into seven feet of water on a remote beach without a safety ring, and I just ten years of age. When the fighting broke out in 1920, I was involved in it to a certain extent. I didn't understand what it was all about, of course, but that's another story. Because, in truth, we in the Donegal Galtacht were never completely colonized. As far back as 1602, Rory O'Donnell had destroyed his pursuers at Cornisleeve and Beltra after the Battle of Kinsale, and the English made peace with him. If he'd been beaten, he'd have been put to death. We still have most of the noble families in the Donegal Galtacht to this day, something that can't be said about any other Galtacht. And I know that the Brehon laws are still followed on strictures relating to the raising of sheep in my native parish, even today. So I spent a while in prison for a cause that I hadn't the slightest interest in, really. This taught me a bit about life, even if it numbed my emotions and creativity in many other ways as well. The likes of us are as strangers among the anglicized Irish. Reflecting on this now, various notions come to mind. How we were forbidden as children from calling a woman a fool, or saying that someone was ugly or a liar. We received the education of the nobility, especially in Eilich, the place where the Gaels held most power in ancient times. The most wonderful thing of all is how the racehorse is better beneath the plough than the heavy nag. Even if our people are quieter and more even-tempered, this doesn't mean that they don't do Trojan work and suffer hardship that would break people anywhere else. We can't avoid the truth, however, and we must suffer it. Seeing as I've brought the discussion around to it, I too have survived many hardships over the years, and benefited by them also. I wasn't following my own road fully when I endured them, however. What I would really love to do is turn the world upside down so that there was magic in every living thing, even if it was only scratching yourself. Indeed, I'd say that you're probably not allowed scratch yourself any more the way things are these days. But says I to myself, Hey, Angum, I'm off to follow my own road now and without your permission, either. So, you get a sense of this fiercely independent, little bit prickly, opinionated, wide-eyed, curious writer dude in Ireland in early 1932, off to walk his own path. If that sounds good to you, please check it out. Thanks for watching.